Good afternoon and welcome to the Gresham Technologies PLC Four Year Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Ian Minocha and Tom Mullen, CFO. Good afternoon. Super. Thanks, Lily. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, yeah, I'm delighted to share with you the 22 results. Uh, and we're pretty pleased with where we landed. Uh, and of course, um, you'll have seen the trading update and uh, pleased to confirm that everything's bang in line with that. Um, so the order of today, um, I just want to start with a reminder of who Gresham is and what we do for those of you that are less familiar um, and just touch on our marketplace. Uh, and some of our key customers. Uh, we'll then look at the 22 results themselves. Um, I'll cover some operational highlights. Tom will then do a deep dive around the clarity business and the financials uh, and the underlying business model. Um, and then we'll take a look uh, forward uh, and look at the market opportunity that sits in front of us, how we're going to market, some of the investments that we're making in product, uh, and then we'll really wrap up with a, a summary of key things that we're focused on for 23. Um, so that's the agenda, um, and we'll make a start. Thank you. Um, so I guess in summary, uh, we're pleased with the financial performance. The results um, were ahead of the original expectations set at the beginning of 22. Uh, and you'll have seen that in terms of the upgrades that came through towards the back end of the year. Um, and I think that comes on top of a year that's really solid in terms of strategic progress. You will recall that we uh, made the acquisition of Electra in uh, 21. And of course, 22, therefore, was our first full year of operation. Um, and so really getting that bedded in was key. Uh, and of course, the most important thing really is that that scale enabled clarity to pass a really important tipping point, the cash EBITDA break-even business for the standalone business. So important strategic milestone for us. Uh, and then in terms of where we stand today, I think we've genuinely got the foundations to scale now. We exited 22 as a much stronger company, uh, 42 million pounds of contracts already in the bag uh, for FY23, and therefore we're in a good position. So for those of you that are less familiar with Gresham, just a quick recap. Um, our focus is fintech, technology solutions for financial services, and really the vision that we have as a company is that every action, every decision that gets taken in financial markets is based on data that can be trusted and processes that can be trusted. Um, and if ever there was a time, the events of last week bring that opportunity into stark relief. So... The way that we tackle that problem is with our enterprise platform. Um, we call that Clarity. We first started to develop that after the last global financial crisis because we spotted an opportunity to improve the control frameworks and the reconciliation of important data that flows into risk and regulatory and financial and operational processes. Um, and so that platform now is pretty mature we can connect to, we can reconcile and control any and all types of data and processes found today in financial markets. That has huge benefits for um, our customers in terms of risk and compliance, in terms of driving out cost um, in their operating models, improving the service to customers, uh, and of course, protecting their reputation. Um, and, and not only that, um, but it enables them to grow their business and act in a more agile way uh, and to invest and grow with confidence and certainty. I'll spend a little bit of a, a, a few minutes on that in a second, just talking about what we do for customers. In terms of our go-to-market model, um, over the last um, eight, nine years, we've started to invest in sales. Our model has been about land and expand, cross-sell into existing customers, grow internationally, um, grow cross industry, and of course, grow through carefully selected targeted M&A work. 
Uh, and that's got us to a point today where we've got 275 customers around the world. Um, good, consistent track record of delivering ARR growth, um, annually recurring revenues, um, you know, compound at 38% over the last five years, um, and pretty good class leading um, ARR retention rates, albeit slightly softened over last year for some specific reasons, which Tom will touch on. But as I said, the most important thing is that we've now got the business to scale. The graph on the right hand side, you can see the growth of Clarity ARR, uh, and you can see the cash EBITDA outcome um, for Clarity on a standalone basis in terms of those blue bars and that important inflection point that we've now reached. And moving forward, we're confident that our business model will drive significant free cash flow. And Tom, again, will touch on that. So that's really Gresham at a glance. Um, just a few moments then on the market opportunity. Um, and I guess um, this will be familiar territory to many of you. Um, it is absolutely a board level issue in financial markets today around managing profitability, liquidity, um, trying to drive out costs and improve the resilience within their operations, tackle the proliferation of regulatory requirements and the growing challenges of managing risk in a very complex interconnected financial market, um, adjusting to structural market changes and there are, there's more afoot. Um, I'm referring specifically to things like T plus one, um, the introduction of faster settlement in the US, um, which undoubtedly will have implications for global financial markets and opportunities for us. Uh, and of course, growing compliance. And then on the customer side of the agenda, really improving the customer experience um, and protecting brand. Um, all of that um, in a world where for our customers, um, competing on their ability to drive digital forward, their transformation programs involving more data, more connectivity, and a far more complex business. Um, so the need to ensure the accuracy of transaction data, which is the oil of financial services, um, is increasingly important. Um, and if you look across the market today, um, the quality of transaction data in financial markets is pretty terrible. Um, that's why in offshore centers around the world, you know, market participants have significant investment in headcount um, to um, do manual processing, uh, handling exceptions, and fixing problems that shouldn't need to be fixed. Um, inaccurate, incomplete, poor quality transaction data plagues the industry. Um, and as I said, that causes problems in terms of cost. It causes problems in terms of quality of service. Um, and of course, it carries risk. Um, and the way that the industry has tackled um, these data transaction data quality problems over the last two, three decades, really since the introduction of electronic trading in the late 80s, uh, has been around manual interventions, in-house built technology solutions that are hard coded, spreadsheets and packaged software from legacy vendors that was designed and built 20 years ago uh, and is no longer fit for purpose, is inflexible, uh, batch based and doesn't really handle the kinds of problems that we see in financial markets today. Um, so that presents the opportunity for us as a business. Um, and, you know, the secret sauce, if you will, for Gresham's success uh, really has been the investment that we made in technology that we started to make 10 years ago and that we have built out through organically through our innovation labs in Bristol and teams around the world. Uh, and also the investment we've made in very, very carefully selected uh, uh, technology buys and other acquisitions. And so this is our platform today. We have the capability to, to grab, to aggregate, to transform, to validate all of the kinds of data that you find in financial markets today. Um, and to bring that data in, whether it's external or internal to the firm, um, and to 
ensure that it is accurate, to apply automation across that data with business rules um, in order to ensure that it flows and um, where we can reconcile and then manage exceptions. We provide um, an exception management environment um, and an environment to continuously improve the quality of data. And the power underneath this is our matching engine, um, a unique capability uh, in the industry today in terms of its ability to handle any kind of data um, to match at scale um, and to deliver match rates that are class leading um, because that ultimately that's what removes the um, exceptions from the process and having exceptions is where risk gets created and where cost is carried. So we have the power of that platform. We package it for our customers into three key areas. One is called data, which is how we aggregate externally held data from custodians and prime brokers. Um, connect, which is a capability to connect to typical financial sources of information and processing, trading venues, regulatory reporting venues, um, and to be able to grab and consume financial messages. Uh, and then our control offering, which is the key platform for reconciliation, matching, applying controls, and managing exceptions. It's a phenomenal technology platform. There's nothing like it in the market today, and that's well recognized by the um, breadth of customers and the quality of the customers that have invested in that technology. And a representative sample um, is here on this slide some of the largest banks in the world, whether they be on the investment uh, banking side or on retail and commercial banking, um, some of the leading investment managers in the world, uh, as well as insurers and other providers of services to the capital markets. And then as you can see, uh, other corporate segments and indeed um, government uh, clients as well. Um, at our Capital Markets Day, uh, towards the end of last year, we had a couple of customers speak, um, Santander um, and Pazina, uh, one customer from the banking sector, one from the investment management sector. There's a great quote here. Um, e essentially, clarity has enabled the bank in question to change outdated and cumbersome processes, ditch legacy solutions um, that were holding them back and ensure they, may, they remain on the right side of the regulator. It's a very powerful statement, and it talks to the value that we provide for our clients. So that's the investment we've made over the last 10 years to build out our tech, to build out our global platform. Um, and we're starting really to see the benefits of that scale that's coming into the business. So I think that's a really good point just to touch on the uh, 22 results. Um, and I'll just start with a quick summary really there, and, and then Tom will, will take you through some of the detail. Um, so you can see some of the headline numbers on the right-hand side. If I just speak more uh, on a qualitative basis, um, I've already mentioned that important milestone in terms of moving clarity to be cash profitable. Um, we won 12 new names, several tier one financial institutions. Um, we announced a number of them through the year, including two in December. Um, flagship wins in investment management, investment banking, retail and commercial banking, and private banking. Um, we're also pretty pleased that we completed the integration of the Electra business. Um, that was completed around the midpoint of the year. Um, and that's starting to deliver cross-sell opportunities. Indeed, one of the big deals that we announced in December was the sale of an Electra product alongside an existing Gresham product to deliver a complete solution for the customer. It differentiated us from the competition and it enabled us to capture a higher deal value. So it's a real concrete example of, of how that acquisitions played off in terms of improving our market competitiveness but also you'll have seen some of the synergies come through in terms of the operating operating costs leading to a couple of modest upgrades uh, as we went through the year. I'm pleased with the progress in terms of our cloud business as well uh, and Tom will talk to some of the growth of key accounts um, as well. So lots and lots of real positives. 
in terms of projects, um, you know, it's really critical for us that we not only win and grow the business, but we deliver value back to our clients. Um, and just two things to highlight. Um, over the last couple of years, we've won and gone live with a couple of the world's largest financial institutions, um, replacing legacy vendor software with our control offering. And those banks have been up and running for a while and we're now starting to get the economic value codified or quantified rather. Uh, and we're seeing some really strong performance um, in particular around the cost takeout as a result of much better match rates. Um, so that gives us confidence that um, not only can we win these opportunities, but we have great references in the market as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, I won't talk too much to this today, um, but those of you that have been following us for a couple of years will have um, seen various announcements on our partnership with ANZ Bank, where we had been jointly developing some new IP um, in the area of digital corporate banking. I'm pleased to say that um, we have delivered against that project. Uh, ANZ are live and ANZ have gone live with their first customer and we expect some joint announcements uh, to come on that um, in the coming weeks um, and our plan to launch that, um, uh, that line of business on top of our existing business um, through the tail end of this year. So a lot of highlights, very pleased with that in terms of the operational outcomes. Uh, and I'll pass to Tom just to touch on the, the underlying financials. Sure. Thanks, Ian. So obviously the milestone for the year, is, as uh, Ian alluded to, is that Clarity has become cash EBITDA positive in its own right. Something we've been talking about and guiding towards for the last two or three years. And we've been through that uh, inflection point during the course of, of 2022 with Clarity in its own right driving cash EBITDA of 1.1 million. So the left-hand side here looks at the revenues coming from the Clarity business. Um, FY22 recurring revenue growth of 46% year on year. On a constant currency basis, that, that coming out at 39%. Um, of course, the, the vast majority of that currency help has come from the acquired Electra business that was acquired in June 2021. The vast majority of which of revenues of which are uh, denominated in, in, in US dollars. So when we then strip that back and look at the organic clarity uh, recurring revenue growth, excluding Electra, it's at 17 uh, percent. And the uh, FX impact to that uh, is only one percent, bringing the constant currency growth on an organic basis to 16 percent. You can also see there the, the, the navy blue bars and see the uh, strong growth in the clarity services side of things. Um, we, we're not looking to grow a services business here. Th this is reflective of the, the number of ongoing implementations we have ongoing at any one time and the level of activity um, across the clarity portfolio, including the digital banking business that uh, or digital banking initiative with ANZ that Ian talked about. Top right hand side. You can see there the, the, the contribution of the non-clarity business in current terms of uh, cash EBITDA and generally that coming off over the past seven or eight years in those navy blue bars at the top. And then you can see clarity uh, gradually improving and coming through that in, in inflection point in 2022, driving that 1.1 million that I talked about. And at a group level, 4.4 million of, of cash EBITDA and the, the margins of, of each business on the bottom right-hand side there. And the thing I just draw out in the, in the um, chart on the bottom right is that the growth in the clarity business and the scale it's getting is helping to ensure that margins at a group level are continuing to improve at that, at, at, at that cash EBITDA level. So now just to look a little deeper at some of those positive group trends. So as mentioned, that continued progress in the group margins is driving cash flow generation. And the chart on the top right hand side there, you can see fairly consistent group gross margins of around the 70% level for the past five years. But again, you can see both at 
uh, group adjusted EBITDA and group cash EBITDA levels continued improvements of, of, of those margins. Again, as just mentioned, as the clarity business um, it comes to a, a size and scale and proportion of the overall business where it's having a real impact on that, those group margins. And the clarity business as a standalone, we'd expect to continue to see operating leverage improvements sort of be uh, take effect throughout the business and those margins continue to rise. Now that is off the, the backdrop, of course, of our other non-clarity business um, with the mix in that portfolio continuing to change and shift towards the lower margin contracting, lower margin contracting business um, from, the, uh, fr from some of the uh, partner uh, reselling business that, 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 that we have that is, is trending off. So we, we'd expect that uh, margin profile to continue to decline uh, on a combined non-clarity business, as you're seeing in the, the, on, on the right-hand side there. But of course, with the, uh, with the offsetting improvements in clarity, seeing the, the, the improvements going the other way and at a group level, us continuing to see those improvements as described in the top, the top, uh, top graph there. With regards to the non-clarity business and the way we, we, we think about that, it, it's been incredibly important to us uh, over the last decade. It's funded the investment in, in clarity for the last decade, but clarity in its own right is now uh, cash EBITDA positive. Um, so that business is very much, or those businesses within the non-clarity portfolio are certainly things that we will continue for the foreseeable future. Um, we have 12 month contractual visibility of both of the lines within there, but actually we've got operational visibility significantly for a significantly longer period than that, at least two years out. Um, what we will um, not see in that business is any stepped drop offs that we are not able to guide too well in advance. We have full visibility of those businesses, but they're not um, ones that we're actively looking to, to, to grow or invest in at all. So now to move on and look at uh, Clarity Forward-Looking ARR. So Clarity Forward-Looking ARR gives us confidence into 2023. Um, the five-year um, compound annual growth rate being 38% um, uh, in total, or 24% when we strip out the impact of the acquired ARR. When we look at FY22 as a standalone, we've seen 17% 17, 17 growth year on year, um, or 10% on a constant currency basis. Um, we we do, do expect those um, Clarity ARR growth to, 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 to get back to levels above 20% as we move forward. And we'll talk about some of the, some of the market drivers that gives us confidence in, in being able to do that in a, in a moment. But our, our Clarity ARR growth has been consistent across all product lines. You can see in the, the, ch the first chart on the bottom right-hand side, um, control being the, the, the lead, um, lead product and, and growing nicely, along with Connect, the data services business that was acquired uh, with the Electra acquisition, mm -hmm. and the digital banking initiative that uh, Ian alluded to, uh, also continuing to grow. Equally, we're seeing... Um, uh, seeing an increase in deployments in Gresham Managed Cloud, uh, Gresham, the Gresham Managed Cloud, um, and, and equally continued growth in um, customers' own managed cloud. So typically all of our deployments nowadays are in a, a cloud environment of some description, but they're not always, it's not always a cloud environment that we as Gresham manage. Um, important to note as well that actually our recurring revenue margins um, Recurring revenue margins in the clarity business are 90% plus across all of those product lines. Once you take into account the implementation services, that, that um, margin across clarity drops to 86%, but certainly across the recurring revenue side of things, it's at 90% plus. And as we, as we continue to build our recurring revenue base, we, we'd obviously trend up towards at a group level towards those 90% uh, margins. Um, ARR retention of 102% experience in 2022, which is, is 
a, still a fantastic result um, and, and market leading for, for the industry. That, that being said, we do still think that's a little bit off where we should be. We should be at least at 105, 106% as we were in previous years. And there are a couple of one-off instance, one-offs in, in 2022, um, including um, us cancelling a couple of contracts with uh, Russian sanctioned banks that just meant that that, uh, that, that, um, uh, that that net retention rate dropped off a little. So, Ian? So. Thanks, Tom. Um, so quite a few questions coming in, so um, we'll try and pick up on those as we go through. Um, what I wanted to talk a little bit about now was, was really around the market opportunity. Um, and so really just looking at the market opportunity and giving a sense of size and scale of that. Um, the core market that we started the business and went after was that re reconciliation and matching market in capital markets. Um, and you know, we've sized that using some external data and some of our own um, work at around half a billion to 750, sorry, half a million, half a billion to 750 million um, uh, market in, finan in capital markets. And, you know, 53% of that's over in the States. So that's why the Electra deal was so important to us. It really opens that market up for us with distribution, with customer support, um, you know, a real platform to go after that, that market. Um, so our primary market to start with is capital markets. We've seen opportunities to grow out of capital markets into banking and payments. Uh, and there I'm talking about retail banking, commercial banking, corporate banking. Um, and, and that market is a little harder for us to size. Um, but certainly in terms of technology spend, it's more balanced um, you know, 50% of the global market or thereabouts is, is here in Europe. Um, and we've also uh, opened up uh, opportunities in, in energy trading with several customers. Uh, you'll have seen a couple of names on one of the earlier slide. Uh, and actually, we've had several wins with government agencies. The kind of um, common denominator here is, you know, data is complex, has volume, uh, it's often fast moving and it's often non-standard. Um, and, you know, industries that have those, um, those uh, kind of uh, um, dimensions to it and often have a regulatory dimension um, really play well for us. Um, we also have the opportunity to expand uh, in the longer run out of those spaces. And, and this perhaps plays a little bit to our thinking around M&A. Um, but, you know, we've acquired and built, um, you know, uh, built out really strong uh, technology in the financial messaging area, the STP, straight through processing area, um, in data aggregation and capabilities around reg reporting. Those are discrete markets on top of the reconciliation and matching market. Um, the reason that we've stepped into those markets is because um, they drive our core opportunity. Um, but it really talks to the point that our total addressable market is growing uh, and that gives us confidence in the long-term viability of Gresham as we expand and win you know a greater share of our customers wallet but in the near term our focus really is around 500 of the largest banks in the world a thousand of the largest investment managers uh, and 50 or so thereabouts um, energy trading firms uh, that have scale, that's a compelling opportunity and that's really where we direct our focus in terms of our sales efforts. And I think what's pleasing is, the, is to see the return on that sales effort. So this slide here talks to really our progress against the market opportunity. Just focused on capital markets, which is a growing market, it's expanding through new use cases. But that market really for a couple of decades or more has been dominated really by a couple of vendors. Um, SmartStream with a, with a number of uh, disparate reconciliation products and FIS with a product called iMatch that they acquired from SunGuard. Um, old and dated, batch-based, inflexible, expensive to run. Um, and uh, really what we're seeing in the market is a strong trend to move away from those platforms uh, to platforms that are more agile, more flexible, offer the business greater capability rather than require 
plethora of IT skills to maintain um, and can handle today's sets of problems. Um, you know, the move towards intraday, for example, or handling non-standard forms of data rather than SWIFT-based standardized data. So that's the market that we go after. And I think what's pleasing is that we've invested in uh, sales teams in key geographies. We've invested in sales teams to focus on specific industries, chosen industries, and we've seen growth across all of that uh, consistently over the last couple of years. And obviously a big step up in our footprint in North America helped by Electra. Um, so, you know, I think we know where to focus um, and, you know, where we do place uh, go-to-market resources, we do get a return from that, uh, which I think talks a little bit to our thinking around the next few years as well. So in terms of our strategy, um, we've talked about land and expand, etc. Um, you know, really, if you think about, you know, what, what's important to us in terms of driving our growth strategy, um, starting on the left-hand side of this, uh, this sort of virtuous circle, continually investing product to extend our functional lead. Um, and I can see there's a question around that, um, our functional lead in terms of what the competitors are doing. The reality is the competitor products in the market are constrained by their architecture. Uh, and none of the key providers has invested to change the underlying architecture of their products. So they still remain batch-based um, and not able to handle the kinds of data and solve the kinds of problems that we see that are the growth opportunity in financial markets today. Um, secondly, we want to seize the opportunity in the US. Now we've got a footprint there. And of course, in investment management, post-Electra, we think over the next three years, we can double the number of clients we have in banking. And the banking clients, in general terms, are the bigger ones. Um, we've seen an opportunity in new use cases, and we've won business in payments, and we've won business in um, digital asset data reconciliation. Um, so this doesn't mean we're targeting crypto firms. What it does mean is we're targeting the... Um, the problem that firms need to do, which is reconcile holdings that they have in digital assets. It's very different, and it's, a, um, I think, a, a better space for us to focus on. Uh, we have the opportunity to build out organically in newer verticals. We've clearly proven that in energy. We've proven that in payments now, uh, and we're starting to get proof points in public sector agencies as well. Uh, and, of course, to go deeper within you know, really a phenomenal, um, uh, you know, set of clients, particularly the larger blue chip, you know, tier one banks. Um, so we'll talk to all of those points briefly uh, in a second. Um, but also on the M&A side, um, you know, we've proven our ability to find, uh, to close and to um, get value from our M&A agenda. Um, and, you know, the Electra deal is a perfect example of that. Um, so our thinking around this moving forward, you know, we're, we're not focused um, on M&A. We're focused on the organic story. Um, but we do have a, uh, you know, a, a list of firms that we watch um, that when the opportunity is right, we will strike. Um, and where we're interested is um, post-trade capabilities um, that are adjacent to where we currently play um, and or... Um, where we can go deeper into the data and connectivity challenges of our financial markets clients. Um, so just to touch on the first uh, point I made around uh, investing in the platform, you know, we've got a phenomenal uh, innovation capability within the business, um, you know, originally out of our uh, innovation labs in Bristol, uh, and then more recently supplemented by teams around the world, um, you know, largely, uh, talent that we brought in through our acquisitions. Um, those of you that have uh, followed our progress at our Capital Markets Day will have seen that in 22, we delivered on some capabilities around natural language processing. We've now got clients live. This, is an, this, this technology enables clients to, in, um, in English, write rules that can be deployed into our platform. Um, so that kind of self-service capability, if you will. 
Um, we've got we've gone live in uh, scenarios where we're leveraging the real time capability of our platform. We've gone live on the digital assets capabilities, uh, and we've delivered now towards the end of the last year. Um, you know our extreme scalability capability, uh, which means we can load and match data in parallel at massive scale. Um, and, and that's, you know, hundreds of millions of transactions a day. And the reason this is important is because the largest banks in the world are trying to work out how they can compress post-trade cycles in order that they can have visibility uh, on their risk at intraday basis uh, and also support the, move, the structural move in the market towards uh, T plus one settlement. Um, so we delivered on all of that last year. We're now working on investigations management. Um, this is a capability that sits above the management of exceptions. So exception management is where there are individual problems, uh, exceptions that get resolved. Um, multiple exceptions can be part of an investigation. Uh, and again, this is um, class leading functionality for our clients um, and um, you know, improves our competitive position. Then as we go through the rest of 23, we've got various drops planned, really in two key areas. One is around the user experience, um, and that's around more uh, web interfaces, more self-service type capabilities. Uh, and then secondly, around the core cloud and platform capabilities. And that's not visible to our customers. Um, you know, in an overt way, but what it does mean is that in order for us to run those services in the cloud, we can be more ever more efficient uh, in terms of our use of hardware and our use of our people to run the platforms, which improves the scalability of our business moving forward. Um, and that's important as we, um, you know, progressively bring some of our developed and acquired technologies onto a common a common stack. Um, so that's what we're doing on the platform side. On the go-to-market side, and, and there's a question here around sales lead times that's come through. Um, you know, we, we have seen sales cycles extend uh, somewhat during COVID, uh, and, um, you know, we, but we're not seeing any slowdown in pipeline growth. Um, we're seeing strong appetite uh, in the banking sector. Uh, to invest, to um, solve automation and data quality problems. We're seeing, I think, improving pipeline on investment management. Um, and the events of the last week with you know, SVB and, and Signature Bank have only heightened the, um, you know, the appetite for firms to invest to get greater transparency into their business to improve their confidence, manage liquidity better, and of course, will only the events of the last week will only serve to drive the regulatory agenda, most notably in the US. So, you know, we're pretty confident in the opportunity in terms of building out sales. We've now got the strongest uh, sales team in terms of um, not much in terms of capabilities. You know, having cross-trained the sales team across the range of offerings, uh, but actually, our account coverage is much stronger. Um, we're up to full head headcount in the US. Uh, we've grown our headcount and, in fact, just offered additional uh, sellers in Europe. Uh, and, um, you know, we've got experienced seller out in AP as well. Um, you know, so we've got, I think, the largest sales team we've ever had and I think the strongest sales team we've ever had. Uh, and also, I think, a very strong marketing program for the year, um, in particular, given that this is really the first year where you know, industry events have come back in fashion and they provide uh, the framework for much of our go-to-market, um, our marketing plans, uh, alongside our investment in digital. Um, and, you know, to that point, you'll see, um, you know, strong, uh, you know, work around our brand through this year as well. So, you know, what we're aiming to do is find opportunities for new use cases or competitor replacements that enable us to land big global accounts and have a run rate of sort of mid-sized deals into our pipeline as well. Um, and, and of course, good account management gives us the cross-sell upsell opportunity, which Tom will touch on briefly now. So, you know, on the sales lead times perspective, 
really that hasn't changed materially. Um, we do have, um, you know, pipeline running through the year, good coverage for this year's opportunities. Uh, and we've got pipeline extending into 24 as well. And, and that's typical of what we would expect at this time of year. Thanks, Ian. So, so everything Ian's just talked about there is really what gives us confidence in the organic ARR growth. Um, so, so ensuring that we achieve, you know, twenty percent on a on a compound basis over multi years. Um, <clears throat> it's, it, the market, the strength of the sales team, and the product that we that, that we have. So we think about our our growth in 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 two core different set segments. One being growth from new logos. And that growth from new logos, we think of really in, in, in two or three different ways. There's, there's three arrows here. I'll, I'll touch on two of them. One is new key accounts. And of the 12 new wins that we want, new name, new logo wins that we won in 2022, a couple of them were, were, were key accounts. Not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean they come in initially at that million, million pound per annum ARR level. It could be this far smaller than that, but have the potential to grow. And we believe that they will grow to that sort of level very quickly. We then have our new new name sort of run rate accounts. These are typically of the level that the minimum new ARR we really do now is 75K per annum at, the, at that sort of level. Um, but there's a, a, a beat rate of a, one about one of those a month. Um, that we've been doing for the last sort of couple of years, certainly since since the Electra acquisition, and uh, you know we see them coming through. That that, that helps ensure that that we're um, we're not reliant on those really big accounts. Now back to those really big accounts. The more we have of those in our in our account base, the the more we're able to 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 to, to drive further growth from them. Be that from upselling deeper occurring services be that selling to a, a new geography, a new function, a new business unit, a new batch of controls, or be it from what we're seeing increasingly um, now, sort of committed and contracted ramps in ARR, where the, where the customer will contractually commit to uh, ARR starting at 100, going to 200, going to 300, as they, um, uh, commit to, as, as they commit up front to a future rollout of, of the software more widely throughout their organization. We then have more traditional sort of uh, just increased usage values. We're, we're able to, given our, our size, scale, and, and reputation in the market now, drive, drive you know, traditional price increases through. Our prices increase each year. Um, and, and then, of course, within contracts with existing customers, we have the ability to increase prices, prices each year as well, typically to an inflationary type measure. And Ian mentioned on the account management side that it's some, something that we want to invest in and improve. We, we certainly feel as though we can reduce churn. And the churn to date is, is really very much experienced at the lower level of, of ARR uh, as opposed to those key accounts. So <clears throat> if we look at the uh, ARR growth and, 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 and the, the cohorts and individual accounts, um, and, and actually this slide goes to answering some of the questions that we've got with regards to customer concentration. But our clarity ARR of 28.1 million at the end of December, made up of 275 customers, grown through both uh, organic um, acquisition and uh, our M&A activities. But over the years, over the life of clarity, we really have proven that long-term retention and not just retention, but growth of those accounts. Uh, the, the net ARR retention rate um, was 102% for FY22 across the entire account base. As I say, we're that's still market leading, but we think we should be doing at least 106% um, of that, as, as mentioned, a couple of one-offs during FY22 not helping us there. But with that chart on the left-hand side, you can really see that that once once we bring a, a new customer in or a cohort of customers in, we're typically able to, to grow them significantly over a, well, over a relatively short period. The chart on the right hand side talks more to the customer concentration um, uh, questions. And um, when we get up the chain, when we do start landing those key accounts and growing them, the potential to grow them significantly is is huge. Um, the net ARR retention rate in FY22 that we experienced within it, within accounts greater than a quarter of a million of ARR was 118%. 
Um, that was on a constant currency basis. The year before, it was in the 120% mark. So the more accounts that we have that are that have that key account um, capability, you know, just the more more opportunity we have to, to to further further grow accounts there. And you can see some other stats there: accounts greater than half a million, um, accounting for for 31% of our ARR. And you can see see on that um, uh, ARR concentration chart that you know our biggest account being about two million of ARR, and then uh, you you can uh, you, you can see there sort of some of the some some of the concentration that, that that we have. But we are focused on both ends of the scale, and it's important for us to be. It is not unusual for a key account to come in with. 75, 80 Ks worth of ARR. And in fact, one of the ones that we announced uh, at the back end of 2022, one of the world's largest banks, a Connect customer, uh, only had 20 or 30 Ks worth of ARR that we increased through through further upsell of Connect capability to about the 300 K level. And there's significant further uh, opportunity to grow that account further as well, to take it up to being, being one of our biggest accounts. So we've shown this slide previously, and it's really bringing everything together. You know, where, where do we stand what, what, uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a business? So how do we think about things? The clarity revenues are continuing to grow as a portion of group revenues. They're driving a, a gross margin of 86% to, uh, as of today. Actually, the recurring element is more like 90%. Um, clarity ARR, so that higher margin piece of it, got a five-year CAGR of, um, of uh, 24%. 38% once we take into account M&A, um, a, a very strong net retention rate of 102% that we're, we're absolutely confident of, of improving on significantly. Um, we're seeing the Clarity business driving cash, positive cash EBITDA for the first time, and that operational leverage will just continue to flow through the business, and we'll continue to see the Clarity business driving group level improvements to, to EBITDA despite any drop-offs of the non-clarity business. And of course, that driving free cash flow. As we play that forward, the way we think about things is we, we, we will ensure that uh, the uh, clarity uh, ARR grows organically at 20% um, over 20% per, per annum over multi-year periods. Each pound of incremental ARR is driving gross margins consistent with the rest of the business. But we, we'll look to ensure we'll look to ensure that on a balanced basis, it drives forty percent to the bottom line, so at a cashy bit dar level, and we will ensure that the investment we will look to direct that investment towards our sales, marketing, partnership arrangements, um, and, and our ability to drive that that top line. Um, that plays out um, just on an organic basis. We have a highly cash generative and, uh, and profitable business, even just in uh, through the through the organic growth plan that we're already starting to see see play out in the clarity business. So this slide really just looks at that 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 in another way. Taking our twenty eight point one million, if we grow at twenty percent, will take us a few years yet to get to that that sort of hundred million level. But even on that journey, we'll have that highly cash generative, um, cash generative business. Um, as Ian mentioned, and Ian talked about some of the sorts of things we might look out for as as um, uh, potential M and A. Um, you know, we will keep keep a lookout for those sort of targets on a very very selective basis, and uh, and, and look to move then if, if if the time and the opportunity is right. Super. Th thanks, Tom. Um, so, yeah, we talked about scaling up and, uh, and driving the financial returns. I, I think it's also important to scale up responsibly. Um, so, you know, we have, uh, as you would expect, um, you know, strong programs around, uh, you know, the ESG side. Um, we've got a clear strategy around that as well. Uh, we've got very good support from our, our board all the way through the levels of management to our employees and we have specific programs in place, for example, around climate change. Um, you know, we've implemented the hybrid working model pretty well to look after our people. Um, we've got ESG champions right across the business by function, by location. Uh, we've appointed mental health first aiders across the business. Um, so very happy with 
uh, the progress that we're making on the ESG agenda. Um, and, and perhaps the barometer for that, um, you know, actually is what our people feel about being part of Gresham. Um, and you can see there that we've been running the same uh, annual engagement survey uh, each year now for six years, same 60 plus questions. Um, and year on year, we get stronger and stronger. Um, and, uh, you know, we've not gone back in any category at all. So um, really pleasing to see that we're building a great company, uh, one to be proud of and, and play a key role in, in our industry and, and in our community. Um, so I, I guess just taking it back up a level, just want to just summarize, I guess, some of the things that are on our minds for 23 um, before we um pass back to, to Lily just to handle some questions. Um, so in terms of what success looks like for this year, um, all of our incremental investment is going into sales. Um, you know, we've currently got a sales headcount in terms of quota carrying direct sales uh, of four in the States, four in Europe, one out in Asia Pacific. Um, any incremental investment we make this year um, we'll go into sales and marketing, um, and you know that will enable us to drive the operational leverage that Tom was referring to. Um, you know, on the product side, we've got a very good plan. Um, we need to move it forward faster. Um, you know, but we are largely working with our existing uh, team. Uh, you know, so really, what we want to see is double-digit ARR growth, single-digit investment in terms of product, and double-digit investment in terms of sales. Um, I think we're pretty well aligned to industry trends at the moment. Um, but what you will see through um, this year is a refresh and a real strong build out of our brand. It's not a name change, but it is a brand um, uh, change uh, to have, I think, real impact in some of our key global markets uh, and more investment to go in to build out a stronger partner ecosystem. Um, what's going to be really important for us and that you should expect to see through the year is landing additional key accounts. Those are the, the accounts that have, you know, really the opportunity for substantial ARR growth over time, you know, very deep pockets. Um, and, you know, investing in uh, stronger account management. So that team of nine that I referred to, you know, they're doing our new business. Uh, and they're managing the relationships with 275 clients. So, you know, we do need to invest further around account management, but that's baked into our plans. Um, and, you know, you can expect to see that through the year. Uh, and then, you know, the outcome of that, of course, is not just bigger account, winning key accounts, but driving the deal volume in our chosen markets uh, and also leveraging, you know, the capabilities that we have of the portfolio, connect, control and data to drive solution sales. So those are some of the things that are really on our minds. And I think just to answer one question while I'm on the topic of, um, you know, our product portfolio, you know, we've got actually pretty good cross-sell stats across the business now. You know, significant number of clients, you know, have both data and control um, already, uh, tens of clients. We've got clients with control and connect. Uh, and in our pipeline, we've got, you know, similar solution deals. So, you know, th this investment that we've made to build out the product set, you know, is materially improving our competitiveness. So that's what's on our minds for 23 in order to deliver a good outcome for you um, and to position the, the, the company strongly for 24. So before I wrap up, Lily, if I pass back to you uh, on the questions. Ian, Tom, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right corner of your screen. Just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed by your investor dashboard. Ian, Tom, as you can see, we have received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And can I thank all investors for submitting their questions? Could I please ask you to read out the questions and give responses where it's appropriate to do so? And I'll pick up from you at the end. Yeah, happy to. And, and I think we've answered a number of these as we've gone through. Um, question around ARR, 10% um, for 22. So that's constant currency ARR growth. 
um, respectable result, um, but below the stated target of 20%. Do we think we'll be able to get close to that in 23? Yes, we do. Um, and, you know, I think bear in mind the commentary around completing the integration of Electra to create the foundations. Um, so, you know, um, over time, you know, we would expect 20% to be a compound annual growth rate in ARR. They're going to be stronger years. It's going to be, you know, weaker years, but, you know, we're, we're, we're in good shape, I think. Um, question around the concentration of our customers. How much revenue does our top customer bring, the top three customers? Um, actually, I think the chart that Tom talked to in the deck covers that nicely. You can see where the dots are um, for the large customers. So I, I hope that's already been covered. Um, I've also commented on the next question already, which is around sales lead times. Uh, sales lead times are extending. Do you have any bookings going into 24? Um, we, we do have pipeline going into 24. We do have contracts with ramps that we would expect to deliver into 24 as well. That's par for the course in our business. Um, you know, and we've obviously got you know, long-term agreements in place, which give us good visibility. Uh, and I think the proof point around that is that at January of this year, we had 42 million uh, already under contract. Um, next question, with increased scale, what do you expect for longer term margin targets? Um, and how many customers have you cross-sold into? I think I've covered the cross-sell point, but yeah. maybe comment on the margins. Yeah, I think we've actually covered the, the, the margin one as, as well, but I think it quite easily sort of play out the, the, the scenario that I talked about, that the you know, incremental clarity ARR from this point dropping 40% through to the cash EBITDA margin um, playing out. And clearly as the ARR um, becomes uh, a greater scale across of our, our group revenues, we will trend towards being a 40% cash EBITDA margin business. And, and just confirm, you know, that's a, that, that, that's a generalized financial model, taking a, an ongoing balanced approach to investing for future top line growth and driving the bottom line. We can very easily pivot from that if the market opportunity or, or market drivers demand it. Yeah, there's a lot of flexibility in the yeah. in the underlying model. Now we've got some scale, um, and uh, but but as we said earlier, the incremental investment will go into driving sales and marketing. Um, a question on: You've previously stated you're well ahead technically of the main legacy vendors. Is that still the case? Absolutely. Um, and do you know if any of the legacy vendors are doing anything about it? Um, uh, so we, we've not lost any new opportunities in my memory in the last 12 months, uh, the 22 period, uh, to any of the legacy vendors. They, they do get um, in their existing accounts opportunities that we arguably won't see. Um, we've also um, replaced several legacy vendors through 22 and in prior years as well. Um, you know, I think... Of those two ven vendors, one's investing very heavily in sales and marketing. Um, the other one is leveraging their um, total relationship with the client, um, you know, their share of wallet to, to structure financial deals. But in terms of investment in appropriate product, they're, they're both hamstrung, as I said earlier, by the fundamental architecture of their offerings. And, of course, the fact that they would be cannibalizing, you know, their core cash business. So, you know, we, we're in a good position. The challenge I think we have um, is, you know, the replacement market is obviously a little tougher than the new opportunity market. Um, you know, it does uh, take an investment from a financial institution to change. Um, and But we've got a pretty good handle of where most of our, large tier one global financial institutions are in their plans. Uh, and in, in our pipeline, we've got several opportunities we're working on. So, you know, we're definitely playing the long game when it comes to the vendor replacement. Uh, you know, I think what you will see is a substantial shift in the market share over a five year period as those legacy vendor, um, uh, you know, install base does get replaced out. Uh, and the final question, what's the Salesforce headcount? I did touch on that already. Um, we've got nine quota carriers. It's small, but perfectly formed. 
Uh, great team. We're very proud of what they do and very proud, of course, of what the whole business does as a, as a global team. Ian, Tom, um, thank you. And I think you have addressed all those questions you can from investors. And of course, the company will review all questions submitted today and we will publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. Before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to yourself and the company, Ian, could I please just ask you for a few closing comments? Yeah, and Lily, thank you to you and Investor Meet Company for hosting us. Um, clo closing comments, I, I guess the same takeaways that we shared at our Capital Markets Day. You know, we have highly differentiated software. It's proven at scale. We've got incredible references. When we're in accounts um, and when we win portfolios of customers, the, re the revenue is very, very sticky. We're in a growing market. The events of last week only serve to really highlight that opportunity. Um, we've built out organically and through our acquisitions a, a, you know, a global operating platform now with teams in, in the key markets around the world. Continue to invest in innovation to drive um, you know, revenue over the long term. But the most important thing now is that we've got some scale in the business. Um, we've got some flexibility in our model. Um, and we're now you know, able to proudly say Clarity has got to that um, you know, real tipping point in terms of its um, you know, profitability as a standalone business. So we've got a predictable, profitable, cash generative model in play. Um, really proud of a team, great team, ambitious management team. Um, and we know what needs to be done to really win that prize um, that I described earlier, which is in five years time, we want to own that market um, in financial markets, you know, of reconciliation and control um, within financial markets. Ian, Tom, thank you for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Gresham Technologies PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Good afternoon to you all.